Okay, here's the objectives. By the time I'm done with you this morning, when you come across a cardiology question on the boards, you're going to go, yes, thank God, a cardiology question. That's how comfortable you're going to be with this, okay? I promise you that. And another thing to keep in mind, if I can understand this stuff, you can understand this stuff easily, okay? So with that in mind, let's go through this. So hang on to your seats, and here we go. We're going to start off by talking about the pediatric electrocardiogram, which strikes terror in everybody's hearts, and then cardiac arrhythmias in the pediatric patient, which you need to have some familiarity with. So let's begin. Very basic, and for most of you, this is, you know this already, but I just want to make sure everybody remembers the P wave represents atrial depolarization, the QRS complex, ventricular depolarization, and the T wave is ventricular repolarization. And remember those boxes on the EKG strip. Each little box is 0.04 seconds or 40 milliseconds, and the big box distances are 0.2 seconds, just to, just to refresh your memories a bit, okay? And some of the intervals that we look at on the pediatric electric or the electrocardiogram in general, the PR interval, the distance between the P onset of the P wave and the QRS, largely represents AV nodal conduction time, just to refresh your memories, and there are some normal values there for you to enjoy. The QRS complex, the duration of the QRS complex reflects ventricular depolarization time, it's usually less than 120 milliseconds. And the interval from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, the so-called QT interval, reflects ventricular repolarization time and normal, when we correct it for heart rate, I'll show you later, is less than 0.45 seconds, really 0.44, okay? So those are some of the basic intervals we measure. Okay, now the 12-lead electrocardiogram consists of a number of leads in this plane, okay, the frontal plane, and then we're going to look at some chest leads that look at activity in this direction. But the standard limb leads that we record on the electrocardiogram include lead one, which, rep, which uh, reflects electrical activity recorded from the right arm towards the left arm, okay? Lead two, which represents electrical activity from the right arm down to the left leg. And finally, standard limb lead three, reflecting electrical activity from the left arm down to the left leg. So, so far we have three of them, okay? We then do something fun for you, okay? And we have chest leads for you to look at, okay? And they are V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6, okay? These are leads placed right across the chest. All I want you to remember is that V1 and V2 provides an excellent look at the right ventricle. V5 and V6 gives you an excellent view of the left ventricle, okay? So now we almost have our complete electrocardiogram. So we have our standard leads in the frontal plane, one, two, and three, and then we have our chest leads, V1 through V6. There's a couple of other little leads here that I've constructed for your entertainment, and they are AVL in the frontal plane. This gives us a perfect view of electrical activity to the left arm. AVR, a look in this direction to the right arm, and AVF, which gives us a look from up to down in terms of electrical activity. We now have the 12 lead electrocardiogram. In pediatrics, we sometimes put a couple of extra chest leads out towards the right here just to get an even better look at the right ventricle. Okay? Those are the basic leads. You've seen them before. Okay. So what do I do when I'm asked to look at an EKG? Okay, I go systematically, even after 35, 40 years of doing this. So rhythm, is there a P wave before each QRS? Okay, that's important. And remember, P waves are normally negative in AVR. Don't get freaked out about that, okay? Rate can be estimated as 300 divided by the number of big boxes between heartbeats. Very simple. And then we look at the PR, QRS, and QT intervals. Remember, each little box is 0.04 seconds. So, the axis, the QRS axis. Here's what I want you to remember. This, is, this really strikes terror, okay? Just look 
in lead one, which is here, and AVF, which is that lead that looks from the top down to the feet. If lead one is positive and lead AVF is positive, that's a perfectly normal axis in this quadrant. That means the electrical activity of the QRS complex is confined to this quadrant mostly, okay? Sometimes in babies, okay, it'll be a little bit rightward in this quadrant where AVF is still positive, meaning electrical activity is largely going down towards the feet, but a little bit away from standard lead one, normal in newborns and young infants, okay? Here's the most important thing in terms of an axis. If you see a negative QRS in AVF, that means the electrical activity is pointing up here somewhere, completely abnormal at any age, okay? And sometimes by looking at the electrocardiogram, you can tell it's a clearly a left axis deviation here, or sometimes you can look at the, QR, the uh, electrocardiogram and say it's a purely right axis deviation, and sometimes it's hard to tell. I'll show you one tracing where it's really hard to tell. But I want you to remember, negative in AVF, superior abnormal axis. It's all you need to know about the axis. Promise. Okay. Okay, so after I do the rate, the rhythm, look at the axis, I then look at uh, any evidence of atrial hypertrophy. So we look at the P waves. And for right atrial hypertrophy, we're looking at these tall peaked P waves. That is how we diagnose right atrial enlargement, right atrial hypertrophy. Or for left atrial enlargement, there are two things we look at. One, as shown here, deeply broadly negative P waves in V1. That can reflect left atrial enlargement. And some of you may also be familiar with the very broad M-shaped P wave in any lead, which represents left atrial enlargement. Good. Doing well. We're almost there. Ventricular hypertrophy. Remember, I said V1 and V2 gives you wonderful views of the right ventricle. So if you see a tall R wave, big deflection, big positive deflection in V1 or V2, that's right ventricular hypertrophy. And it's usually re reflected by reverse findings in the left-sided lead, so deep S waves in V5 and V6. But all you have to do is look at V1 and V2. If you see big, 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 tall R waves, probable right ventricular hypertrophy. Here's one you guys sometimes forget about. Positive T wave in V1 is normal at birth, but then by about age three days or four days or five days, it should flip to become negative. If it doesn't, that's right ventricular hypertrophy. And then a QR pattern in V1 at any age is right ventricular hypertrophy. Summarizing, big R waves in V1 or V2, right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay? Positive T wave after about a week of age, right ventricular hypertrophy. Left ventricular hypertrophy. Remember, I said V5 and V6 give you an excellent look at the left ventricle. So once again, if you see big, tall R waves, big, tall QRS, big QR in V5 and V6, that's left ventricular hypertrophy. It is sometimes accompanied by deep reciprocal S waves in V1 through V2, okay? And a tall R wave in AVL can also be a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy, okay? After doing that, I then look at the ST and T waves. Make sure they look normal. You know what they should look like, okay? If they don't look normal, if I see diffuse STT wave changes, I'm starting to think about electrolyte disturbances maybe, myocardial diseases, not so much ischemia in kids, but I'll, I'll consider it, okay? And ST elevations, ischemia, pericarditis. So I'm looking at each segment of the electrocardiogram, okay? Briefly, let's look at a couple of them together, okay? And I know you have more in your book to look at. So just here we go. Okay, so looking at this, I'm starting off sinus rhythm. Remember, I told you I look for a P wave before each QRS. And I'm looking now for my axis. And look at what I told you. Remember I said look in AVF to see if it's positive or negative? In this case, AVF is negative. That means the electrical activity is not in the normal segments quadrant. It's up in the air, abnormal. Okay? That's all I want you to know. This happens to be a left axis deviation. And 10 of you at the end are going to come up at, you know, and breaking. how do I know it's left axis? From a cardiologist's point of view, if I see a QR and AVL, I know it got there through a leftward axis. Don't worry about it. I just want you to see the negative in AVF and know that this is an abnormal axis. Um, looking at the ventricles, look at these tall R waves. You see these tall R waves in V1? 
And V2, remember I said that reflects right ventricular activity. This is too much right ventricular activity. This is right ventricular hypertrophy. And it is also accompanied by what I told you you might find reciprocal negative S waves in V5 and V6. But the money here is looking at AVF, abnormal axis, big voltages in V1 and V2, right ventricular hypertrophy, superior axis. Okay. Here's an eight-month-old with a murmur. Sinus rhythm, there's a P wave before each QRS. Once again, I look at AVF and I go, hmm, negative. The electrical activity of the QRS is being directed superiorly. In this case, trust me, I'm a doctor. It's a right axis deviation, okay? And now, look at the P waves here, V1 and V2. Typical of right atrial hypertrophy, right atrial enlargement, and right ventricular hypertrophy because... Pure R wave and V1, but look at the T wave. Remember I told you the T wave should be perfectly beautifully negative after about a week of age? Not the case here. This is not a perfectly normal negative T wave. This is right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay? Okay. Uh, Eight-year-old girl status post-heart surgery. We see this a lot. Sinus rhythm. Here, when I look at the axis... I notice that it is positive in AVF. So I know it's going to be the QRS axis is pointing somewhere down towards the feet, the foot leads, okay? In this case, it's pointing a little bit away from one. Okay, so here's one, okay? Here's the foot lead. So this QRS axis is over here somewhere, a little bit rightward. And look at the duration of the QRS. Does everybody see the bunny rabbit ears? Okay? Right bundle branch block pattern. Okay? This is just to give you a flavor of how these things go down. All right? Oh, here's one. Six-year-old boy with a harsh murmur. We'll talk about this a little later, what this is exactly. Sinus rhythm. Again, look at AVF. Positive and normal. Therefore, the axis is somewhere in the lower quadrants. The, uh, in standard lead one, the deflection is a little bit negative, so it's sort of to the right a little bit of the normal, normal axis, the quadrant that we look at. Look at the tall QRS complexes in V5 and V6. This is left ventricular hypertrophy. Remember, V5 and V6 gives you a perfect view of the left ventricle. And it is accompanied, as I told you earlier, by deep negative S waves and the right-sided leads. Okay? You look at this, you go left ventricular hypertrophy. Big voltages, where? V5 and V6, left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay? Chest pain. We're going to talk about this diagnosis a little later. Sinus rhythm, axis is normal. Look at, this, look at this QRS axis. Positive in AVF, good. Positive in lead one. So it's in this normal quadrant down here, right? Between zero and 90 degrees. Um, I don't see hypertrophy per se, but I think everybody can see these ST segment elevations typical of probable pericarditis. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about more of that later. But I'm just trying to show you to look at each segment, each aspect of the electrocardiogram. And the ones you will see on the boards if, will be pretty obvious. They're not going to be tricky. Okay? They're going to be kind of like these. Okay? Everybody happy, more or less, with the electrocardiogram. I hope that was an okay review for you. And again, you have others in your book to look at and to enjoy. Okay? All right. Arrhythmias and conduction disturbances in the pediatric patient. You all have seen these. I just want to review these for you so you know how we think about them in terms of when we're sitting down for the boards. Okay, let's do some cases, okay? And, and the meat of the matter is in the yellow. Eight-year-old boy, previously healthy. His pulse is noted by the nurse to be irregular. About 80, but then periods of bradycardia. Emergency consult to cardiology, please evaluate. Followed by more rapid rates, very scary, okay? On exam, apart from the irregular pulse, no other abnormalities noted. This is a common finding, and we get referrals for this. And this is most likely sinus arrhythmia, okay? So when I look at a tracing, I see what you're doing. I see your eyes. Don't go there. That's where you're all going. Don't do it. Start where it looks most normal, and after 35 years, I still go PQRST, PQRST, a pause. There's a P wave there. QRST here. Repeats. PQRST, a pause. PQRST, this is sinus arrhythmia. Most common cause of an irregular rhythm in children, okay? 
When you breathe in, your heart rate increases. If you don't believe me, feel your pulse. When you breathe out, your heart rate decreases. It's normal. The more you have, the healthier it is. Okay? It just so happens that sinus arrhythmia is really kind of evident and prominent in children. It scares people, but it's normal. It's also prominent in dogs. Anybody have a dog at home? Nobody has a dog at home. Don't believe it. Did you ever listen to the dog? Were you worried when you heard the irregular rhythm? But you didn't do anything about it, did you? Okay? All right. All right. I, that's the right thing to do. Sinus arrhythmia, reassure, reassure. It's healthy. It's normal. If you're in the office and you want a diagnosis, just tell the 8-year-old kid if he can hold his breath for a little bit. Rhythm becomes regular. You're done. Nothing to worry about. Okay. Call to the nursery. 10-hour-old infant. Irregular rhythm. Skipped heartbeats. Urgent cardiology consult required. Okay? Get an electrocardiogram, maybe. And this is what you're very likely to see. PQRST, 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 and an early beat with a narrow QRS complex. In this case, you're really lucky you actually get to see the premature atrial contraction. Sometimes you're not going to see that P wave, though. You'll just see this QRS even a little closer to the previous one. This is common in infancy in the newborn. Benign, 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 benign. No workup, no electrolytes, no cardiology consult, no echo, no CT, okay? Benign. Nothing, you, I see, I'm telling you, nothing to do here but reassure, okay? 15-year-old boy with the dreaded note to sign for football clearance, okay? Patient denies any symptoms on your exam, multiple extrasystoles. This is really scary, okay? Kid is asymptomatic, no heart murmurs. EKG shows premature beats. These are beats that occur early, therefore they're premature. Wide QRS complex, therefore they are coming from deep down in the ventricles. These are premature ventricular contractions. They're common in children, and they are largely benign. So if the kid is asymptomatic, you, you don't detect any heart problems, you don't detect any heart problems, benign. If you want to really convince yourself they're benign, run the kid up and down the office a little bit. Get the heart rate up. Listen to the heart again. If the rhythm is now very regular, you're done. Sign the permission slip, okay? Benign premature ventricular contractions. This is common stuff that you need to be aware of, okay? So look at all the things we just talked about that are common in childhood that require no therapy. Sinus arrhythmia, no therapy. Pauses, escape beats. I don't even show you those, but who cares? Normal. Don't worry about them. Premature atrial beats, common in the neonate and infant. Nothing to do. Premature ventricular contractions. I don't care if they are 35 a minute. I don't care. Common in children and largely benign. Oh, sometimes we get consults. Sinus bradycardia. Please evaluate. Guess what? If you have a 15-year-old kid and he runs four miles a day and then gets on his bicycle and does 15 miles and then swims for two miles, his heart rate's going to be 45. Get over it. Okay? All right? commonly seen in young athletes. Use your head, though, okay? If it's a post-op patient, any symptoms, we want to know about it, obviously. And have I ever seen hypothyroid with bradycardia? Yeah, but even I could tell it was hypothyroid from across the room, okay? So consult not required. Sinus tachycardia, please evaluate. What we do, what you have to do, is just think about what the underlying potential causes of sinus tachycardia are. So anemia, fever, pain, anxiety, yeah. Hypovolemia, yeah. That's what causes sinus tachycardia, okay? Have I ever seen a kid with hyperthyroidism and tachycardia? Yeah. But from while I was walking through the waiting room, I said, oh, hyperthyroid, okay? So that's how we think about sinus tachycardia. Okay. That's the benign, extremely common stuff that you've all seen and dealt with, okay? They largely require just reassurance. No treatment and largely no workup, okay? Now let's talk about the stuff that you need to know about because they're important and they can hurt you, okay? So this I'm going to predict 80% of you have seen. Two-month-old infant comes in the emergency room not looking good, okay? Baby's mottled, breathing fast. Liver's down a little bit. The heart rate is 280 beats per minute. That's a big clue, guys. I've seen you sometimes in, uh, in the treatment rooms or in the wards. Let's rule out sepsis. Let's rule out metabolic. Hello, 280 beats per minute. That's a big clue, okay? And you might get an electrocardiogram, and this is what you're going to see. Guarantee it, okay?
This is a narrow QRS tachycardia at rates that exceed anything a sinus tachycardia can do. I've seen sinus tachycardias of 190, 200, 210, eh, not 280 or 300, okay? And notice, I don't really see P waves before each of these QRSs. This is supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia, most common age of occurrence, three to six months of age. It can happen anytime. It can happen to me right now. But the most common age is three to six months of age. Most of these kids have perfectly normal hearts structurally, no heart disease. And they present with signs of heart failure. Poor feeding, poor perfusion, labored breathing. That's baby heart failure, you know, like not JVD, okay, or pillow orthopnea. That 50% of these babies will be in heart failure if this continues more than a 12 to 24 hours, and some will die. So we need to know how to take care of this. To stop the tachycardia, you have to do something, okay? And I'm going to go to this one. I want you to look at this one really carefully. That's cardioversion, okay? It's never wrong to do it. And especially if the kid looks really sick, and you think you might lose this kid, shock him, okay? Just shock him. It's fun and it works, okay? Do it, all right? The mistake that happens in outlying emergency rooms is people spend four hours trying to get an IV in. Baby dies, okay? If you happen to have an IV or, you know, at our center, I don't know how they do it, but the nurses can put an IV into anything. The drug of choice is adenosine. If you want to do that, that's okay, okay? If the kid's not too sick and you want to do something fun, with supraventricular tachycardia, all the impulses are coming down the AV node. That's why the QRSs look nice and narrow, okay? If you can just stop a conduction through the AV node, you'll stop the tachycardia. That's what adenosine does, okay? But another way to do it is with a bag of ice, okay? So it's known that if you take a cold bag of ice, put it on the baby's face, it'll profoundly slow down AV node conduction, cause block, and stop the tachycardia. The diving seal reflex, so in Antarctica, when a seal dives into the cold water and the water hits the receptors of the face, heart stops. Guarantee it, okay? So that's what we do. Take the baby, bag of ice. I say to the mom, you may not want to watch this, okay? Put it over the baby's face. How long? Till the baby stops kicking. Only kidding, okay? <laughs> okay. okay? About 20 seconds, okay? about 20 seconds, and you have about an 80% chance of stopping the tachycardia. Okay, so now the tachycardia is stopped. Now what do you do? You gotta do something else. Can't just send him home, okay? If you just send him home, he'll be back, okay? All right. So we treat with medication, and for the young infant that I just described, we'll treat the baby for about a year. Then stop the medicine, and 90% of them, you'll never hear from them again, they'll be fine, okay? If they're older, when they first have their tachycardia, 8 years old, 10 years old, 14 years old, 20 years old, it's not likely to go away, okay? And for some reason in pediatrics, if they are going to recur, yeah, 6 or 8 years of age for some reason is when they recur. That's the data. So what do we use to treat this? I think the two big players are digoxin and beta blockers. Beta blockers are terrific. I put them on oral beta blockers, send them home, they're fine, okay? 90% of them, okay? Digoxin. Some of you may have been taught to use digoxin. It's okay, all right? But I'm going to tell you something right here. Don't use it if there is overt evidence of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome pattern on the EKG that you will get after you stop the tachycardia. Stop the tachycardia, then get an EKG. If you see the typical Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern, short PR interval, slurred QRS, no digoxin. If you don't want to be bothered with this whole thing, just use propranolol or, you know, other beta blocker to prevent recurrences. There are other antiarrhythmics that you wouldn't use, but we would. You're not responsible for those. And then, you know, for the child who's older when they present with tachycardia or not tolerating medications, don't like medications, we can do a catheter procedure where we take a catheter, go up into the heart, find out where this rhythm substrate is, and either burn it away with radio frequency energy or cryoablate with a cold freezing burn in somewhere in the heart. Okay, so this is chronic treatment of supraventricular tachycardia. Now remember, I said look out for Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern on the EKG that you will get after you stop the tachycardia. And here is an example of what you're looking for.
It's not in every lead. You've got to look a little bit, okay? So look at this guy. Look at the short PR interval. Everybody see the short PR interval? And does everybody see the slurring of the upstroke of the QRS? Huh? That's the typical delta wave that tells you that there is a Wolf-Parkinson-White pathway somewhere in the heart connecting the atrium to the ventricles, and it is alive and active during sinus rhythm. It works in sinus rhythm. Those are the babies who are, or the kids, and definitely the adults, who are at risk of having atrial fibrillation, then ventricular fibrillation if you use digoxin. So stay away from digoxin if you see this pattern on the EKG that you will get after you stop the supraventricular tachycardia. Okay? Everybody cool? All right. In fact, most infants and babies do have a Wolf-Parkinson-White type connection causing their tachycardia. It's the most common cause in young children. Very different from adults and older children. But in the typical infant and in neonate, what's happening is an impulse goes down the AV node hysperkinji system. All right, that's cool. But then it finds this pathway. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, and you have supraventricular tachycardia. It's only in those small numbers of babies who show you the wolf parkinson white pattern when they're in sinus rhythm. Only those do you have to stay away from digoxin. Okay? But this is the first most common cause of supraventricular tachycardia in children. Okay, I mentioned ablation. Don't worry about these numbers. We can take catheters, find out where in the heart these pathways are, and then once we have determined where they are through an electrical study, put a burn or a freeze right there, cure the tachycardia. 95% success rate, 95% safe. Okay? Very, very safe. Um, uh, any mortality here is in very, 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 very sick small infants with left-sided left procedures. Don't worry about that. Very safe, very effective radiofrequency catheter ablation. Okay. That's supraventricular tachycardia. I spent some time on it because it is a common pediatric rhythm disorder. How many, just for fun, how many in this room have ever seen it? Yeah, okay, there you go. All right, most of you. Great. Okay, moving on. Six-year-old girl with structural heart disease. Known tricuspid atresia, had surgeries, atrial surgeries and stitches and everything to repair. We'll show you that later. And for the past 12 hours, not feeling good. Heart rate's over 200 mild respiratory distress, no murmurs, no organomegaly. I think you might get an electrocardiogram here, okay? And it shows this typical sawtooth pattern, and in somebody with structural heart disease and extensive atrial stitching and surgery, think of atrial flutter. Notice the sawtooth pattern. By the way, atrial flutter is a Rhythm that occurs mostly originating in the right atrium where the impulse goes from the top of the right atrium to the bottom of the right atrium to the top of the right atrium to the bottom of the right atrium. And that's why the P waves go up, down, up, down, up, down. That's why you get the sawtooth, okay? And here is the close cousin of atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. Notice the fibrillatory irregular P wave baseline and the characteristic irregularity of the QRS rhythm. Atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. Let's talk about it in childhood just a little bit. And I'm going to talk about mostly flutter because fibrillation is uncommon, unlike in adult cardiology. If you see a child with atrial flutter or fibrillation, unlike SVT, where I told you the hearts are basically structurally normal, think of things that might cause scarring, stretch, dilatation of the atrium. Something's wrong with these hearts usually, okay? So what am I thinking about? Mitral insufficiency, congenital heart disease, surgery of the atrium, after repairs of, and we'll look at these a little later, but something is wrong with the heart causing dilatation and stretch of the atrium. One exception right here. So those of you who are neonatologists are familiar with this. In the normal fetus, in the normal newborn, sometimes their little atria are just so jazzed up that they throw themselves into atrial flutter. All you got to do is get them out of it once. They're cured. Very benign. Okay? So uh, other than that clinical scenario, the normal fetus or the normal newborn in atrial flutter, think of underlying stretch dilatation, something wrong with the atrium and with the heart. So what do you do about this? Well, 
Remember cardioversion. If a kid looks sick, I mean really sick, cardioversion. Don't worry about it. Okay, just do it. Okay. But for treating atrial flutter and fibrillation, it's usually a two-step approach in the emergency room. So number one is slow AV node conduction. All right, the atria are going crazy in flutter and fibrillation, sending rapid impulses down to the ventricles. If you can just stop the AV node conduction a bit, slow AV node conduction, you can get the kid's heart rate down to whatever you want, 60, 70. The atria may still be going three, four, five hundred a minute, but with medication, you can get that ventricular rate down to 60 or 70. So IV beta blockers, uh, Esmolol. IV calcium channel blockers, diltiazam, okay? Um, not too much digoxin anymore, okay? But you can, your patient feels much better, okay? You then generally have to do something to stop the atrial rhythm, okay? You can shock, okay? Or you can use different medications that you're not responsible for, okay? But it's usually a two-step approach. And I think some of you may know that particularly with atrial fibrillation, which is a very stasis-y kind of rhythm in the atria, what the cardiologist will generally do is give something IV to slow the AV node down, put that patient on the same medication by mouth to go home with, atria are still fibrillating, but also with the addition of Coumadin for about two weeks because clots can form in this atrium. And you don't want to shock this atrium either with an electrical shock or a drug shock and break loose a clot. So particularly for atrial fibrillation, we will slow the AV node down, give Coumadin, send them home, then bring them back for part two of therapy, which might be a shock or a drug shock to get the atrium back into normal sinus rhythm, okay? We have created generations of complex atrial flutters from all the heart surgery we've been doing. So there's 20 and 30 year olds and 40 year olds out there with very complex atrial flutters. The adult cardiologists are not happy with us, okay? They're very hard to treat with medication sometimes. We have a couple of tricks up our sleeve that we can use. One is a special pacemaker that I'll show you. It's not gonna be on the boards, just so you leave here enhanced in some way, okay? And then the radio frequency catheter. So here's a case of a child I met when I was in Louisiana, the great state of Louisiana, who had an extensive atrial surgery, and she, which I'll show you later, later on this morning, but she had atrial flutter. Everybody see the atrial flutter? Couldn't control it. So I said to her, you know, come on in, we gotta do something here. Put a pacemaker in, wire was in the atrium, and what this anti-tachycardia pacemaker does is listens for the occurrence of atrial flutter. If it detects atrial flutter, it delivers a series of painless shocks to the atrium, get her back into rhythm. Anti-tachycardia pacing. We'll still do that if we think we have to, but we've gotten really good with our uh, radio frequency catheter. We can go up into the atrium, find out where this atrial flutter circuit is, and put a burn, okay? 75% success, not quite as good as SVT, but certainly worth a shot, okay? Atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. Okay, here you go, guys. Three-year-old boy, tachypnea, general fatigue, gastroenteritis two weeks ago, pulse elevated, breathing a little hard, muffled heart tones, liver is firm, Get an EKG. Is it a tachycardia or a bradycardia? It's a tachycardia. Is it a wide or a narrow QRS? It's a wide QRS. And I'm telling you, think ventricular tachycardia, and you will be treating the patient correctly. There's always one or two in the audience who goes, how do you know it's not SVT with aberrancy? Don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> All right. Treat the kid <coughs> like ventricular tachycardia, and you'll do the right thing. I know. This is ventricular tachycardia because we have the wide QRS tachycardia. And look at the AV dissociation. I see P waves popping through now and then. That's ventricular tachycardia. Now in pediatrics, we have to think about the underlying cause. Kids don't usually go into ventricular tachycardia too often. It's not like the adult hospitals where they come in all day long, okay? So you have to do a little checklist in your mind. What's going on here? So myocarditis. Yeah, I've seen myocarditis present with very bad ventricular arrhythmias. Cardiomyopathy, abnormal heart muscle. Oh yeah, ventricular arrhythmias. Long QT syndrome, electrical diseases. Oh yeah, not, not rare. Electrolyte disturbances, definitely. Ingestions, these are kids, okay? And if it's a child who's had surgery, a post-op ventricular arrhythmia. Notice heart attack ischemia is not on here. Okay, I do think about it a little bit, okay? But it's not the big player here, okay? So what you're gonna do for the kid depends on what's going on here, okay? 
Sometimes you don't know, acute therapy, kids in the emergency room, shock them or defibrillate them. If you're gonna get a, give a drug IV, I think you all know IV amiodarone is the drug of choice. Okay, so now he's not in ventricular tachycardia anymore and then we have to come in and help you to figure out how to treat this kid. What is the underlying cause? You're not responsible for that. Okay, but you, you have to do this checklist thing, okay, in order to figure this out. So here's one example. Four-year-old boy, recurrent syncope and seizures. Recurrent syncope, MRI, EEG, MRI, EEG. Finally went to a cardiologist, a friend of mine. Cardiologist said, I don't know what you're doing here. This is obviously seizures, you know. And she said, okay, put the EKG lead on the kid. Kid fell to the ground and had a seizure, okay? And the mother is in the office. She's going, that's it. That's what he does. That's what he does five times a day, okay? And look at the history a little more detail. Mother had a sister who died suddenly at age 14. Hmm. That's a warning sign. This is what was recorded, okay? And this is a twisting, turning, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia sometimes called torsades. If you encounter a patient like this, magnesium can be very helpful in terminating this episode, but they often terminate on their own. And in this child, this is what was recorded when the kid woke up. And what this is, is long QT syndrome. The distance between the QRS to the end of the T wave is prolonged. And the T waves are usually not very normal looking. These are a little broad and bizarre looking. What I want you to know is to calculate the QT interval. You measure from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. That's the QT interval right there. But in order to correct for heart rate, because QTs change with heart rate, you have to divide it by the square root of the RR interval, this interval here, to correct the QT interval. It should be less than 0.45, okay? This one's wildly abnormal. So long QT syndrome can happen in response to certain medications and certain electrolyte abnormalities, but congenital long QT syndrome is out there. It is not rare. If you have a young patient with recurrent unexplained syncope and seizures, yes, think of you know neurologic, whatever, but if you don't think about this, you're gonna miss something bad, okay? Get an EKG. They typically come into the office with everything but an EKG or evaluation. We used to talk about syndromes, Gervell Lang Nielsen, very rare, autosomal recessive with deafness. But what's out there big time is Romano Ward syndrome, autosomal dominant, no deafness. We now know that the long QT syndrome is caused by mutations in sodium and potassium ion channel genes causing abnormal repolarization of the heart, causing re prolonged repolarization of the QRS complex. Whenever you get prolonged repolarization, you are at risk for torsades. So that's what's going on here. Just for your entertainment, will not be on the boards. These are the genes and the channels and the chromosomes of the three most important mutations causing long QT syndrome and they're there for your knowledge, okay? But what's very important is we can now gene test kids for some of these mutations. So if I have a mother with long QT syndrome and the question is, does the child have it? If the EKG is not wildly abnormal and I'm still not sure he doesn't have it, I can do a gene test and find out. So it's been a very helpful tool. How do you treat them? Beta blockers are life-saving. So you can really save lives just by putting these kids on a beta blocker like propranolol. The interaction of the sympathetic nervous system with these abnormal ion channels is, is what triggers the rhythm problems. And if you can just stop the sympathetic impulse, you can really save lives. <clears throat> and kids who are high risk, meaning they've been resuscitated or there's lots of sudden death in the family, I just put in an automatic internal cardioverter defibrillator. It listens for the occurrence of ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia and delivers a shock to terminate the rhythm. It's absolutely life-saving. And as I mentioned to you, uh, magnesium can be used in the acute treatment of a child who is in torsades. Very good treatment. Okay. So, ventricular arrhythmias, you have to think about what the underlying cause is. In the case I just presented to you, it was an ion channel disorder. Okay, long QT syndrome. Here's a kid who is in our PICU. The nurse calls you. What's this? Ventricular tachycardia, wide QRS. You have to ask, what's going on here? Why is this kid in the unit? 
Notice the normal sinus beats, such as they are, PQRS with a peak T wave. So this happens to be a ventricular arrhythmia secondary to hyperkalemia. So this kid doesn't need to be shocked, doesn't need lidocaine, doesn't need amiodarone. Kid needs to get the potassium lowered. So in pediatrics, you have to ask what's going on here in order to do the right thing with ventricular arrhythmias. Here's a good one. You'll like this one, maybe. Apologize to my resident who's heard this before. Okay. This was a kid came into my clinic. This was also in Louisiana. Cowboy hat, Wrangler jeans, cowboy boots. 18 years. So, hey, it was 16. Yeah. What can I do for you, cowboy? Yeah. Here. I ride the rodeo. Oh, yeah? What can I do for you, cowboy? Go, Every time I get on the bull, I pass out. Okay. I said, Every time you get on the bull, you pass out. Go, yeah. So to me, this is sounding like a catecholamine excitement induced something. By the way, in pediatric cardiology, chest pain, syncope, shortness of breath with exertion, red flag. Okay? So I have my red flag up here, you know? And I go, okay, cowboy, kick them boots off. Let's get on the treadmill. Let's do a little catecholamining here, okay? So he starts on the treadmill faster and faster. And what happened here? Ventricular tachycardia slid right off that treadmill, okay? <laughs> and, okay? This is a very well-known entity, catecholaminergic ventricular tachycardia. We know the abnormality is due to ryanodine receptor mutations, mostly, and treated them easily with beta blockers. But just another example of asking yourself, why? What's going on here in pediatrics? In the adult hospitals, it's easy. Ischemia, 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 ischemia. This is different in pediatrics. Okay, finish up with a couple of conduction issues that will be on the boards, okay? Number one, PQRST, PQRST. In this case, you might notice that there's a large distance between the P wave and the QRS. You need to know the name of this. This is called first degree heart block, prolonged PR interval. Generally quite benign and asymptomatic. Do I follow these? A little bit. Okay. Here's another one for your entertainment. Now, by now, I am pleased to see your eyes not going to here, but starting where it looks most normal, there. So PQRST, PR prolongs a little bit, QRST, P wave, and a block beat. Okay. What is this? Wanky bog, you, you a lot of different names. Let's, let's, uh, let's collaborate here on our terminology. Second degree block, meaning some of the P waves don't have QRSs after them. Type 1, changing PR interval, also known as Wanky bog. Okay? By the way, when Wanky bog described this, there was no EKG machine. He listened to the apical heartbeat, that was his QRS. He looked at the A wave of the jugular venous pulse, and he said, there must be decremental conduction through the AV node followed by a drop beat. That's physical diagnosis, okay? We follow these, okay? But this is prime material for the boards. Okay, here's another one. What do you want to call this? Some of the P waves don't have QRSs after them. No changing PR interval. So this is second degree block because some of the P waves don't have QRSs after them. Type 2, PR intervals are all equal. Okay? We follow this, and some of these kids are a bit symptomatic, and some need help. But I want you to see the rhythm. Okay? And finally, if you're in pediatrics, OB, family practice, whatever, you're going to get called to a nursery one day about a newborn baby who looks pretty good with a heart rate of 55. And what you're probably dealing with here is congenital heart block, okay, in which there is complete dissociation between the P waves and the QRS. So here's a P wave, there's a P wave, nothing to do with these QRSs, okay? Third degree block. Do we see third degree block in pediatrics? Yeah, congenital heart block is one scenario. That's described over here, which is due to the transplacental passage of antibodies from the mother IgG crosses the placenta and attacks the fetal um, conduction system and also myocardium a bit, okay? And these mothers have underlying connective tissue disease, often asymptomatic, uh, 
But if you draw blood, you might find a positive ANA, positive anti-RO, positive anti-LA antibodies. Bodies, congenital heart block. Curious, how many of you seen this? Okay, nice number, nice number, good. There's also acquired heart block. You can acquire heart block as a child. How do you do that? Well, you're having heart surgery, and the surgeon hits the conduction tissue. That's surgical heart block, okay? And then there are infectious diseases. If you are tripsing through the forest in Lyme, Connecticut, or eastern Pennsylvania in the summertime, your age, and come into an emergency room in heart block, you have Lyme disease, period, end, okay? And then sometimes endocarditis, there can be abscesses of the conduction tissue. So acquired and congenital heart block. How do we treat heart block? Well, pacemakers, okay? And here's how we think about the treatment of heart block in children. Surgical heart block, that's the heart block where the surgeon created the, the heart block. I'll give that kid seven days. I don't care how good he looks. I don't care what his heart rate is. But his heart rate is 70. Leave him alone. No. You put a pacemaker in because you get a phone call two months later that they died. Okay? Congenital heart block, you got some time and you got some thinking to do. They don't need an urgent, immediate pacemaker. Symptoms, yes. Obviously, heart failure. Otherwise, we look at heart rates to guide us. So in a child without underlying structural heart disease, as long as the heart rate's 55-ish or better, leave them alone. Okay? If the child does have an underlying congenital heart problem, I don't like to let that heart rate get much below 70 without putting in a pacemaker. Okay? And that's how we think about treatment of heart block in children. Okay, here we go. The meat of the matter. Congenital heart disease. I'm going to try to show you what these lesions are, how we think about them, what we do about them, and why. Okay, this will be a little bit of the longer haul. Okay, and then we'll lighten up again towards the end. Okay? All right, congenital heart disease. Here we go. The most common birth defect. Your chance of having a child with a congenital heart defect about 1 in 100. Okay? higher if you count spontaneous abortions. Obviously, if you have a history of a heart defect, your offspring's risk may be even higher. For aortic stenosis, if you have a bicuspid aortic valve or aortic stenosis, risk may be as high as 15% for your offspring. If your mother, your brother, your sister, you know, if they all have heart defects, you're in another risk category altogether, okay? But for the general population, about one in a, one in a hundred, eight per thousand, same kind of thing, okay? Etiology, what causes this? Most cases are considered multifactorial inheritance. This is not a waste basket. This is a real uh, um, uh, causation issue here, and it's due to the interaction of genes and environmental factors. And increasingly, we're getting to know the genes that are important and responsible for congenital heart defects. You're not responsible for these other than this one. The deletion in chromosome 22, responsible for the DeGeorge locus. Okay, we'll talk about what heart defects you would do a fish test for, fluorescent in situ hybridization, to detect this deletion. Okay, the others are there just for your entertainment. Okay, so 5% of congenital heart disease are due to these gross chromosomal abnormalities. Too many chromosomes or too little chromosomes. So you must, for the boards, know the association of Down syndrome with AV canal, endocardial cushion defect. Must, guaranteed to be asked. You must know the association between Turner syndrome, the XO chromosomal arrangement, and coarctation of the aorta. You must know about trisomy 13 and 18 and the association with VSD. Every pediatric board review course talks about Cree du Chat syndrome and its association with VSD though I would be surprised if, you were, if that appeared on the boards. But the first three, for sure. Okay. And here is, this is also, on, on your notes, this gets an asterisk, a highlight, yellow everywhere, okay? The FISH test, the fluorescent in situ hybridization test to detect the deletion of chromosome 22, the long arm of chromosome 22, the region responsible for the DeGeorge syndrome. And here are the heart defects that you should say to yourself, uh-oh, I need to do a fish test. Truncus arteriosus, I'll show you that later, and I'll remind you about it later. Interruption of the aortic arch, 
pulmonary atresia with a ventricular septal defect, maybe tetralogy of Fallot. For certainly, the first two or three on that list, if you see a kid with that, you get a fish test. Keep in mind, they may not have the typical DeGeorge look to them, the facies, okay? They may or may not have hypocalcemia because of absent parathyroids, immune problems because of an absent thymus, or developmental delay. They may have some or none of that. Doesn't matter. Get a fish test with these heart defects. Some are due to mutations, single gene mutations, and some are dominantly inherited. And these are associations you're going to need to know. Noonan syndrome associated with valvar pulmonic stenosis and in some young infants, a hypertrophied heart, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Marfan syndrome, mutation of the fibrillin gene, okay, associated with aortic root dilatation and dissection. Williams syndrome, okay, elastin mutations associated with peripheral pulmonic stenosis, abnormalities of the peripheral pulmonary vasculature, and a, I'll show it to you later, supravalvar aortic stenosis, so a narrowing of the aorta above the aortic valve. holt oram syndrome, abnormalities of the limbs, association with ASDs and VSDs. Again, this you should go into the boardroom knowing, okay? This is, and there's no, no good way to do it. Got to go download it onto the hard drive. That's all there is, okay? So dominant inheritance. Um, there are a couple of autosomal recessive inheritance, single mutant gene mo uh, mutations. Ellis von Kreveld, Every board review course teaches it. I've seen it once. Atrial septal defect with abnormal nails. I think you could probably skip that question, okay, and do okay, okay? Pompe's disease associated with cardiomyopathy. So these are the different ways that congenital heart disease occurs. Then there's congenital heart disease due to environmental factors and toxins. So know some of these associations. Lithium with Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve, a displacement of the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The next one, no for sure. Ethanol, fetal alcohol syndrome, ASD, VSD. How much alcohol is it okay to have during pregnancy? None, okay? Anticonvulsants can cause congenital heart disease, and retinoic acid can cause congenital heart disease, such as transposition of the great arteries. Know the lithium and know the ethanol ones, and try to keep your eyes on the other two as well. Just, again, we're into the rote memory part, sorry. All right? <laughs> Not my fault. Okay, other environmental factors, okay? Infections can cause congenital heart disease. Um, when I was where you are, we used to see congenital rubella. So know the association between congenital rubella and PDA and peripheral pulmonic stenosis. We saw kids with this. And infections, in utero infections, Coxsackie B, causing not congenital heart disease, but neonatal myocarditis. Okay. Other maternal factors, know these, know these hard, know these in cold. Diabetes, associated, maternal diabetes, associated with hypertrophic hearts. Babies are born with hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. How many of you have seen that? Yeah, I would have thought more, but okay. Sometimes transposition. We just talked 15 minutes ago about the association of a maternal connect connective tissue disorders with heart block. And finally, Mental ketonuria, PKU, very high risk of congenital heart disease, uh, sometimes complex congenital heart disease. Very important that mom is in good control with PKU if she gets pregnant, okay? So maternal environmental factors. Okay, so th that's the etiology and what causes congenital heart defects. So kind of got to know those four or five pages, okay? Now, we're going to now talk about structural congenital heart disease, and we're going to start with left to right shunts. Left to right shunts are the septal defects, ASD, VSD, PDA, okay, where there's a connection between the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart. What happens here is blood flows from the higher resistance, higher pressure left side to the lower resistance, lower pressure right side of structure, so left atrium to left ventricle, left ventricle to right ventricle, aorta to the pulmonary artery. Blood increases flow into the pulmonary vasculature, okay? That's the problem, okay? Here's something to underline, star, yellow, whatever you like to do. If a left to right shunt's gonna cause heart failure, it doesn't do it day one or two or three, and it doesn't do it at age eight years or 10 years. It does it between four to six weeks of age. Because when you're born, you're born with high 
pressures, equal pressures, right and left side of the heart. No shunt, sometimes no murmur, no nothing. After birth, in the first four to six weeks, the resistance comes down in the lungs, and now the red blood cells in the left ventricle go, oh, I'm getting out of here. Let's go to the right ventricle, whoosh, out into the lungs and floods the lungs. Okay? So symptoms at four to six weeks of age, think left to right shunts. Symptoms, baby heart failure. Again, shortness of breath, retractions, poor growth, failure to feed well, sweating with feed. Baby heart failure. Okay? And here's the deal, folks. Why do we operate on these kids? Well, sometimes we operate because they're symptomatic and they're not growing. But even those that are asymptomatic, we always ask ourselves the question, are they at risk for, up here comes a visual, after sometimes months, sometimes years, and in certain instances a couple of decades, if you have continued high flow to the lungs, see the little arterioles? First what happens is medial hypertrophy occurs, and then intimal proliferation and loss of vessels. Now you have a very high pressure, high resistance pulmonary vascular circuit. You have irreversible pulmonary hypertension, the so-called Eisenmenger syndrome, and a slow and miserable death with hemoptysis. So the answer to the question, why do we operate on left to right shunts? Well, we do it for symptoms, but we also do it to prevent this. Never forget this. Very high tech. Okay? All right. This can take decades to occur. So people with ASDs get this in about two, three, four decades. Okay? A uh, simple VSD, it can happen in years. Okay? And in the AV canal, the Down syndrome children, three, four, five, six months a year, done, finished. That's why we operate on them so early. We'll talk about that later. So that's an important page to keep in mind. Okay, VSDs, very common, 25% of all congenital heart defects, usually isolated, but there can be other things wrong. Many in the newborns, we were talking about earlier, little muscular defects, you've all heard those. They close pretty easily and very often. Um, membranous ventricular septal defects, which occur right here, right under the aortic valve. I'll show you a picture. Uh, less likely to close over time. Here's a nicer picture of the different types of ventricular septal defects that we encounter. Okay? These are the little muscular VSDs. Okay? Here is a membranous ventricular septal defect right under the aortic valve. Okay? And then there is a defect that sometimes occurs under both the aortic and the pulmonary valve, the so-called supracrystal defect. And the only importance about that <coughs> is this, tend, this defect tends to suck the aortic leaflet in really badly. And particularly in Asian patients, for some reason, it sucks the aortic valve in so much that there's significant aortic insufficiency and it's a big mess, okay? So I just want you to know about the association of this type of defect with aortic regurgitation. Okay, physical exam. Murmur may not be present at birth. Remember we said that. Symptoms, not until four to six weeks of age. Remember we said that. Physical exam, with your hand, a thrill at the left lower sternal border, a buzz, always a ventricular septal defect, okay? And with your stethoscope, a harsh regurgitant systolic murmur, easy to hear. What's a regurgitant systolic murmur? One that starts right with S1. There's no space, no diamond-shaped murmur. So it sounds like shh, shh, shh. You've all heard it, okay? So a regurgitant, harsh, easy to hear systolic murmur. If the pulmonary flow is large enough, if there's so much blood going to the lungs, coming back to the left atrium, you might even hear a little sound in diastole as the blood gushes from the left atrium into the left ventricle through the mitral valve. And this is important for the boards. They like to ask you, what are the physical findings of pulmonary hypertension? Loud second heart sound. So if there's pulmonary hypertension, the answer to the boards is a loud, prominent second heart sound. Chest x-ray. The heart may be large, and look at this increased pulmonary flow. Does everybody see this increased pulmonary vascularity? When we see that, we know there's a left to right shunt somewhere. With a small defect, the EKG might be quite normal. With a large defect, you may see left ventricular hypertrophy or even biventricular hypertrophy if there's some pulmonary hypertension present. How do we treat ventricular septal defects? If they're small, we don't do anything. Reassure. Okay? For symptomatic infants, so for that, remember we said that four-week-old, six-week-old comes in breathing hard, not growing. Medicines, afterload-reducing agents, diuretics, hope for spontaneous closure. So you don't send them right to surgery because there is a good chance that this defect might get smaller or close on its own over time. So we try to get the baby into better condition medically, 
increased caloric intake because A, we want the baby to give, have a chance for this defect to go away on its own, or B, if the baby needs surgery, we want the baby to be bigger, better condition for surgery, okay? But if symptoms persist, failure to thrive, increasing pulmonary hypertension, operate. Now, if asymptomatic, so this is, this is the four-year-old in clinic, asymptomatic, but we think either by exam or echo or some other modality that there is twice as much blood going to the lungs as normal, we will say to mom, guess what? Surgery is required because we don't want this to happen. Okay? That's why we operate on an asymptomatic child with a left to right shunt, to prevent this. Everybody happy? Ventricular septal defect. That's how we think about it. That's what we do. PDA, you've all, all of you have seen PDAs and been annoyed by them in the nursery and, you know, okay? It's pretty, very common, 10% of congenital heart disease, common in the, in the newborn nursery, very common. You know, we get called up to the nursery, is there a PDA? We do an echo, no PDA, you want to wait 10 minutes? Guess what, PDA, ha ha, okay, all right, <coughs> okay. If large, it can cause symptoms of pulmonary overcirculation, shortness of breath, failure to thrive, and cause this one day. Okay? Irreversible, horrible pulmonary vascular damage. Physical exam. Know this one. Outline, yellow, whatever you do. Okay? Bounding pulses and that typical machinery, continuous murmur, left upper sternal border. You've all heard it. Okay? What do we do about it? Obviously, in the nursery, give a couple of doses of indomethacin. Chance of three doses. Is he still doing three doses? I think so. Chance of closure about 80%. Okay. Otherwise, operate, surgical closure. Or in the older kid, we're getting really good putting catheters up into the heart, plugging the ductus up. So catheter closure of the PDA. All right? Patent ductus arteriosus. So this one I want to talk a little bit about, the atrial septal defect, and I'll tell you why. 7% of congenital heart disease, usually minimally symptomatic ever, or no symptoms at all. Very characteristic of the ASD. What's happening here is blood is gushing from the left atrium to the right atrium. You don't hear that. The blood then gushes from the right atrium across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. You don't hear that. I sometimes hear that, okay? A little S3, a little diastolic sound, okay? Then this big bag of blood in the right ventricle shoots out the pulmonary artery, okay? Maybe a little flow murmur, but not a big murmur that punches you in the nose. Okay, so atrial defects get missed, okay, because the physical findings sometimes are not like right in your face, okay. What you're looking for, board question, the hallmark of an atrial defect is the fixed splitting of the second heart sound. Okay, when you take a breath in, up here everybody, A2, P2. When you take a breath in, extra blood goes back to the right side of the heart, P2 delays. Blow your breath out, P2 comes back. If you have a hole in your atrial septum, it's like always taking a deep breath in. You always have extra blood coming back uh, to the right atrium, so you have a fixed split-second heart sound. Listen to yourselves this evening, okay? We've operated on 5-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 24-year-olds, and 34-year-olds, okay? Listen to your S2. Make sure it splits normally, okay? Yep. Three types of defects to know about. This is the most common one, the bullet hole right in the middle of the right atrium, the so-called ostium secundum defect. Okay, can be closed surgically if needed, but we've also gotten really, really good with catheters to put little devices there to close them. So surgery not as common anymore. There's a defect down here, right on the lower part of the septum, which is caused by partial failure of fusion of the endocardial cushions. Let's go back to embryology, okay, together. Let's travel. <laughs> endocardial cushion defect forms the lower part of the atrial septum the upper back part of the ventricular septum, and the AV valves, okay? So when there's partial failure of fusion of the endocardial cushions, you might get a defect right there in the lower part of the atrial septum. And sometimes you see a defect in the upper part of the atrial septum, the so-called sinus venosus defect. They're all a little bit different. Surgical correction of this is easy. We could do it. You, can, you and I can go in the operating room and do it. Hey, what do you want to do? You want to close it? You want to suture it? You want to patch it? You're not going to cause any harm. Surgical closure of this you got to be a little careful of the conduction tissue. And you might have to look at the mitral valve and see if it needs a little surgery also. It might have a cleft, okay? This puppy, you need to be careful of the sinus node, and you need to be careful and help the 
pulmonary veins get to where they're trying to go to. So all ASDs all sound different, all sound similar, all incredibly different in terms of the surgical approach. Elective surgery or catheter closure of all defects by age five, especially if we think there is, again, look up twice as much blood going to the lungs, and we're much more aggressive in young ladies. We'll close even smaller defects, because when you're pregnant, you might have a little clot form in the lower pelvic veins and the abdominal veins. If a little clot breaks off, and if your atrial septum is okay, the little clot goes right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, lungs, cough, cough, fever, fever. I don't feel well today, okay? But if there's a hole in the atrial septum, it could go across to the left side, paradoxical embolus. So a little more aggressive in the young ladies, okay? As I mentioned to you, the osteum premium, the endocardial cushion type defect, that's this one. This one low down here, called the osteum premium defect, usually repaired in early childhood. Look out for the mitral valve. It may be abnormal. And I mentioned to you the sinus venosus defect, this guy up here, careful of the sinus node, help the pulmonary veins get to where they're trying to go to. So incredibly different surgically. And remember, the atrial septal defect, if it's going to cause this, usually takes a few decades. But it's unusual to find a 40 or 50-year-old patient with an ASD without significant pulmonary hypertension, and it's very unusual to find one 60, 70, or 80 years of age at all. Okay? So it's an important defect. I mentioned the failure of fusion of the endocardial cushions, and when there is partial failure, you might get a low-lying atrial defect. This is what happens when you get complete failure of fusion of the endocardial cushions. You get this low-lying atrial defect, you get the upper back portion of the ventricular septum not formed well, and the mitral and tricuspid valves are completely abnormal. Instead of a mitral and tricuspid valve, you have five leaflets just trying to fulfill the function, okay? Here's board stuff for you, guaranteed, 100%. Very common in Down syndrome. And I think you know the American Academy of Pediatrics and Family Practice recommends an echocardiogram on all patients born with Down syndrome. Huge left to right shot. Look at the size of the hole in the heart there. And they get the early development of heart failure, and they get the early development of this irreversible pulmonary hypertension. So the exam, loud first sound and a loud almost single second sound. Remember, pulmonary hypertension, correlation, loud single second sound. The right ventricle is palpable and booming right over here. Okay? You might hear a murmur, you might not. Okay, you might hear a murmur of a valve leaking or a septal defect, but you might not. Very often, very quiet precordium from the murmur perspective. X-ray, big heart, increased flow. And here's something I want you to remember. There are a couple of heart defects that on electrocardiogram show a QRS axis up here, left axis deviation. This is one of them. So the endocardial cushion defect almost always is associated with a QRS axis up here. I'll talk a little later about a cyanotic defect that has the same axis, and then you will know everything you need to know about left axis deviation. Corrective surgery, early, four to six months of age. Close the VSD, close the ASD, and where the artistry comes in is the surgeon taking these leaflets of the mitral and tricuspid valve and trying to create a nice mitral and an okay tricuspid valve out of that mess. Done very successfully, 95, 96% success rate. Okay, done at four to six months of age. When we talk about left to right shunts, I have to mention this one, okay? And this is the anomalous origin of the left coronary artery. So here's what's happening here. Instead of, here's the aorta, instead of there being a right coronary, like we see here, and a left coronary, coming off the aorta. The left coronary is coming from here, from the pulmonary artery. Okay. So, at birth, the pulmonary pressure is high. No problem. No shunting. But then, the pulmonary pressure starts dropping at, like it normally does a few weeks after birth. And now look what happens. Blood goes from this coronary, from the aorta, the myocardium, and it gets stolen out to the lungs. So there's your left to right shunt. Everybody see the left to right shunt? And it's robbing blood from the myocardium. So in addition to a left to right shunt, you have ischemia, angina. So a board question, a two-month-old 
uh, you know, two to four to six week old baby with crushing chest pain when feeding, think of anomalous left coronary artery. EKG will show an infarct pattern. And surgery is mandatory to implant this abnormal coronary back into the aorta. Anomalous left coronary artery. There's others that you have in your notes you're not going to be asked about, but I wanted you to have them for completion, complete as safe. Okay, new topic. Okay, ready? Okay. One day, you will get called to see a baby who looks like that to the nursery. Cyanotic. So we're talking about cyanotic heart disease. Let's talk about what this is, how we diagnose it, how we treat it, and how we think about it. First, give oxygen. You do that reflexively and instinctively. Any baby with cyanosis, you slap the oxygen on, and it's called the oxygen test because if the baby's PO2 goes from 20 to 180, it's lung disease. Get an x-ray, figure out what it is. Your problem, not mine, okay? It, the PO2 does not change. If it goes from 20 to 21 in 100% oxygen, heart disease. My problem. Yours too. I'm going to make it yours too, but my problem. Okay? Think of the famous T defects. T defects. These are the cyanotic heart lesions. So asterisk star underlining yellow marker. Tetralogy flow, transposition, tricuspid or pulmonary atresia, truncus, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. These are the cyanotic heart lesions. We'll talk about each of them a little bit. Some of the defects are characterized by obstruction to pulmonary flow. So the pulmonary stenosis of tetralogy, tricuspid or pulmonary atresia, blood can't get to the lungs. The chest x-ray will show you diminished pulmonary blood flow. Typical x-ray. So the heart's there. Some of you are asking, is it an egg? Is it a boot? Who cares? Look, very unhelpful in the newborn period, by the way. You know that. Look at the lungs. They're black. Greatly diminished blood flow. Even before cardiology is called, you will open your bottle of prostaglandins and give it to the baby because prostaglandins open ductuses. And if you open a ductus, you can get blood flow to go to the lungs and get some blood oxygenated and back to the baby. Okay? Side effects of prostaglandins, a little low-grade temperature. Neonatologists do sepsis workups. The cardiologists go, you don't have to do that. Okay? Apnea. Okay? You can intubate them if you want or you can just play with them a little bit or lower the dose. Okay. So think about congenital heart disease, cyanotic disease. Let's talk about some of them with decreased pulmonary flow. Let's contrast for fun pulmonary atresia, no pulmonary valve, versus tricuspid atresia. Both will prevent very cyanotic when the ductus closes. No more, there's no way, no other way for blood flow to get to the lungs. Ain't going to happen. Okay? On chest x-ray, both will show this diminished pulmonary blood flow pattern. No blood getting to the lungs. Here's where you can tell the difference, EKG. Remember I said there's one other heart defect that has this axis deviation on EKG? It's tricuspid atresia. So if you have a baby with cyanotic, diminished blood flow, EKG shows left axis deviation, little to no murmur, tricuspid atresia. Pulmonary atresia typically has a normal axis on the EKG. So even without the echo and all that stuff, you can kind of know what you're dealing with, okay? So, here's a case of pulmonary atresia, okay? See the pulmonary valve is blocked here. Notice how important it is to open the ductus, okay? And here is a case of tricuspid atresia, okay? So, tricuspid atresia, there's basically no right ventricle here, okay? Again, notice the importance of opening the ductus with prostaglandin to get some blood flow going to the lungs. What do we do with these kids? Well, prostaglandin in the nursery, get the ductus open, confirm the diagnosis, usually by echo, okay? And then here's where we do a surgical procedure to get blood flow to go to the lungs. We will ask the surgeon to construct a shunt between the subclavian artery, usually, and the pulmonary artery, like that. Now the baby has a permanent or semi-permanent little ductus, and the baby can go home because there's blood flow going to the lungs. Whenever you connect a subclavian to a pulmonary, you're doing a variation of the Blaylock-Tausig shunt. 
B.T. shot. Blaylock, Alfred Blaylock, the surgeon at Johns Hopkins who did the operation for the first time in the 1940s. Helen Tausick, the cardiologist who talked Alfred into doing it. He didn't want to do it. Helen would say, Alfred, I do think if you would just connect the subclavian to the pulmonary, maybe some of these babies could go home. And Alfred said, Helen, get away from me. I don't want anything to do with this. Okay? And then 1946-ish or so, uh, he did it, and that was the beginning of surgery for cyanotic congenital heart disease. Now, in the old days, that's all we could do were these shunts for these kids. We couldn't do much more for these kids. That's changed a little bit. And here's how it's changed. In the old days, we would shunt, shunt, shunt until we couldn't shunt anymore, and that was the end. But then a surgeon from France, from Bordeaux, France, which if you've never been to, it's wonderful. His name was Francis Fontaine. And he is exact, the way you're picturing him right now is exactly the way he is. Tall, gray hair, charcoal gray suit, okay? Pretends not to speak English, but does, okay? <laughs> And he said, you know, these right ventricles are obstructed and they're terrible. They're never going to be used. He said, but I think if you diverted all the blue blood in the heart directly to the pulmonary arteries, I think if the rest of the heart is normal, the blood, she will flow. Okay? So here's how we do this operation now. Connect the superior vena cava to the pulmonary artery. Take the inferior vena cava, root it to the pulmonary artery. So now you have all the blue blood flowing to the lungs, just like in your heart. And amazingly, it works, and the kids do well. Not perfect, but well. If I took you to a schoolyard and said, there's 100 kids here, find the five who've had this operation, you couldn't do it. They're pink, 100, you know, 95% saturated, running and playing. So a major, major advance, the Fontan operation for uh, congenital heart disease. Okay? We don't do it at birth. At birth, we'll do the shunts. We'll do this at about one or two years of age the Fontan operation, and sometimes we do it in stages. Okay? Fontan procedure. Tetralogy of Fallot, a guarantee for the